evening, everyone. It's fabulous to have you all along this, uh, this evening. I want to, uh, I guess, commence tonight with that big thank you. I know that I'm supposed to do thank yous at the end of a session like this, but I, I do want to begin by thanking you. It's um, with my principal hat on. Um, for those of you who haven't met me previously in my visits to Frankston Primary School, um, I'm a former school principal. Uh, my name's Adam Voigt, and these days I head up real schools. And when I put the real schools hat off for a moment, put my principal hat back on, I'm reminded of how critically important it is that we have a cohort of parents in our schools who will give up a little bit of their time to try and get on the same page with the school about how we're tackling critically important components such as not only how we build resilience in young people, but how we can train them to be in the company of other people and learn and collaborate and do amazing and exciting things that we know are gonna be so pivotal in terms of their future success. So I want, to, um, I want to begin by thanking you for being those parents who will, who will give up that time. And we're going to put that focus and attention into how it is that we can build a resilient child this evening. Um, I know that it's something that parents are thinking about. Um, and I know because I'm often asking parents the question around resilience. And I ask them, what's your, what's your hunch? What's your feeling? Uh, do you think that kids these days are more or less likely to be resilient, more or less likely to sort of be able to pick themselves up, dust themselves off, to have another go, to persist through difficulty, to cope with difficulty, to cope even with failure and with things going wrong than kids were, say, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And we get uncomfortable about the answer because... We want to say, no, it's there. And, and, and you're right to a point. It is there. We do have resilience in our young people today, and that's fantastic. But there's a hunch that so, so many parents are getting these days that perhaps not quite so much. And we want to do something about that. And I'm really determined to be of absolute service to everybody who's here as an attendee this evening because you're the parents who want to do something about that. And it's not something that we can achieve in a you know kind of big collective way the school is implementing an approach called restorative practices which is our big collective effort to do it but in terms of building resilience it, it really does happen one kid at a time and when school and parents such as yourselves work together on that um, that's that's truly exciting that's absolutely fantastic so before i get into doing things like you know defining what i mean by resilience and um and where that um and how we can get to work on that as parents and as educators. Um, I do want to begin by letting you know that in a webinar, for those of you who haven't done a webinar before, it can feel a little bit like you're watching Netflix. It can feel like you're watching a, a movie on the, on the screen and that your interaction with that movie is to do no more than watch it and enjoy it. Um, I want to let you know that there's more than that that you can do in this webinar today. So for instance, if you have a look at the control panel at the top of your screen, uh, or for some of you it's at the top of your screen, depending on what you're using, it could be in a different spot. But if you do have a look, you'll see that there's a couple of ways you can get involved. You can chat, so you can go into a chat room where you can actually have everybody hit, so you, know, you can have a little conversation while things are going along there. There's often a Q&A box that you can use, and I will see what you're talking about if you put a Q&A in there. So I'm gonna try and be really responsive in this webinar today and keep the Q&A box open on my screen. And that means that if you do ask a question in there, I will be able to see that question and I'll respond to it either by typing an answer to you. So you might notice that you know, a webinar can be something that's not quite as smooth as a Netflix movie or a series. Uh, we'll stop and start and I'll respond and you'll hear me pause and I'll go over and have a look at see if there are any questions and anything that people wanna know. So your question may even at this point be a technical one. If you've had something bob up, you know, oh, what does this button do on the screen? I, I reckon we might be able to help you with that. Um, but if it's about the content of the webinar also that we're talking about, then, um, then you can feel free to pop that in there. And I'm gonna pause because I, I just, I'm just firm in the belief 
that if you ask a question, even if it's pertaining to your child, and I won't use your child's name in a forum like this, absolutely, probably suggest you don't either. Um, but I reckon that if I answer a question for you, it's going to be of service to the room because I bet that you're not alone in your questions around resilience. So make sure that you do, that you, you take, um, take a veil of those things. And I think also too, that in most of the Q and uh, most of the, um, the, the Zoom uh, control panels that you've got available to you, I think you'll also see a hand up option somewhere where you can pop your hand up. Now, this is the scary bit, in that I can see you all. Now, don't panic, don't panic. I actually can't see you. I'm not tracking the, uh, the webcam of the, of the device that you're using at the moment, but I can see your names. I can see that I've got uh, Inga there. I can see Kate, I can see Kylie, I can see Mel. How frightening, the principal, Renee's even in the room. Um, there's a great name there, Anesia, I think is, uh, I'm gonna have, that's gonna be my attempt at that. So there's, I can see, See names there and if you were to put your hand up I will take that as a signal that you'd like to talk and what I can do is press a button that's called allow to talk and it'll take control of your microphone um, and we'll be able to hear you verbally if you've got something you'd like to contribute as well so let's make this presentation less Netflix and more conversation. Uh, what am I talking about when I'm talking about resilience? I'm talking, I, I, the reason I use this picture as my title slide today is that um, probably the best description I've heard of resilience is by a, a fellow who's really dedicated his life's work to this area. It's a guy called Andrew Fuller. And Fuller says that um, resilience, they're, they're the dandelion kids. They're the kids who will grow through the cracks in the concrete and the asphalt if they have to. And so this picture reminds me of that definition, um, of that description, I guess. If I was to go deeper than that and get into like some sort of dictionary definition of what I mean by resilience, my favourite definition of resilience is that it's the ability to thrive despite risk. It's the ability to do well even though there are some conditions in front of you that make it hard to do well. Uh, it's the ability to overcome obstacles. It's the ability to you know, get through when things are a little bit tough. And so I really have come to enjoy, to rely upon that definition of it being able to, of it being all about being able to thrive, to do well, despite risk, despite difficulty. Uh, that often takes me back to the very, very first, I guess one of my most poignant memories um, of teaching a, a young girl who was in year five and she um, was probably the most resilient young person I can remember. She uh, used to come to school often about 15 minutes early. She would knock on the door before the bell went at the start of the day. Teachers adore these students, just so you know, um, because they become like our unpaid assistant teachers. Um, so she would come in at the start of the day and tut tut me. She'd go, oh, Mr. Voigt, look at this room. And it was a, you know, I can be a bit of a messy teacher. So she would come in and tidy up and she would get my board organised and my desk organised. And she was just amazing. She was on the school's SRC, so the student leadership group for the school. She was definitely on that. She was a recognised student leader. She was a fabulous friend um, and a wonderful learner, incredibly intelligent. But she did all this despite risk. There were some significant risks in her life. Uh, one of them was that I know that her father was in like a special operations group of the Defence Forces of Australia and was often away on classified missions, um, which meant he couldn't even contact the family um, and tell them that he was, to be honest, alive. And that that positioned a lot of stress upon that family and that was a risk for her. Um, one of the other risks was the way that her mother was responding to that stress. Um, it became evident over time that she had a significant issue with alcohol, this young student's mum. And we knew this because of the condition that she would sometimes show up to the school in and her daughter would be horribly embarrassed, unfortunately. And, and, and I guess in her times of soberness, her, her mum would have been very embarrassed too. Um, and I knew also that her little brother was, uh, she was in year five and his her little brother was in year three, just a few classrooms up from our classroom. And he was giving his teacher uh, a, a merry old time <laughs> in terms of being able to handle his behaviour and get him engaged in his learning. So there was a lot going on in her life that we would consider as being a risk factor. Yet she thrived 
And so my job as an educator is not to share the private details of her story. Uh, my job as an educator is to share what is it that goes on between her ears? What, what, what is the self-talk? Um, what's the, what's the strategizing? What's the thinking that this student does? And can I access the other students that I'm with to that thinking? My ambition tonight is to access you to some of that thinking. One of the things I've become, I, I came to notice when I look, started to look into the research around resilience was how much role modeling matters. So while as parents, one of the most powerful things you can do with a young person is to talk to them about about resilience and to also demonstrate that resilience themselves yourself to them um, it's also worthy to try and find heroes that you know you get to a certain age with our kids and they don't want to see us at heroes as heroes for a few years so we lose some status and the halo slips um, we want to actually allow them to look outwardly into their world and see who are the heroes out there that i would like to admire who I'd like to to go for I'm often talking to teachers about one of the great things they can do and parents at a at a more informal level can do this too is to talk to your kids about who their resilient heroes are in fact I encourage teachers to do resilience projects to have their students look online for famous people who they admire and who have demonstrated resilience now if we don't unpack for the kids what we mean by have demonstrated resilience, then they just tend to look for who's famous. If I see one more attempt at a resilience, um, a resilient hero project that involves a Kardashian, I'm, I may scream, <laughs> but I'll get through that with a little bit of resilience. But if they start to pull apart, what are the qualities of resilient people? They start to notice other role models that um, that, that they can aspire to be like. I often have, I found myself one, one boy who was, um, who was running a, a, doing a resilience project. He brought this slide to me and said, can I use this Mr. Voigt? And I, I've really come to, to, to love this quote by the famous basketballer, Michael Jordan. Uh, and he says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. And I often pause there and say to the kids, just, just stop and imagine that. Stop and imagine that for a minute. Thousands of people watching, millions of people at home watching, four seconds left on the clock, one point behind the Chicago Bulls are. The coach brings the team into a timeout and says, we're going to run what the coach Doug Collins of the Chicago Bulls um, at the time used to run was he had a very important play for this moment and the play was called get the ball to Michael everybody else get the out of the way and um, so Jordan knew that this was going to happen and there must have been times when out of 26 times that he missed the game winning shot there must have been like two or three in a row it must have happened a few times he must have gone oh please no not me again. I don't know that I can do take this anymore. Could, could we not pass it to Scotty Pippen tonight and let someone else have a go? But somehow Jordan found the way to keep taking that game-winning shot. And he says that he failed over and over and over again in life. And that's why I succeed. And I think that young people with a healthy attitude to failure is an admirable thing to look for in a resilient young person. One of the games and activities that I uh, often play with kids is to uh, ask them to build me. I, I spent several years of my life in Darwin in the Northern Territory and I asked them to build me from Lego a, um, a Northern Territory home, build me a Darwin home, think about what would be different in terms of architecture and climate. And um, if, you don't get, if you don't get the home done right in four minutes, then I'm going to smash it with my, my mallet. I pull out the mallet and show them. Ooh. Um, every single time, no matter what they build in the first four minutes, I smash it. Not because there's often anything wrong with the house, but because I want them to experience almost an unfair and an arbitrary failure. I want to see how they respond. And then I tell them, listen, when it comes to building a house in Darwin, these are the things you need. 
got to be elevated to try and catch some cool breezes. You've got to have somewhere like a, a spa or a pool in the backyard that I can cool off in because it's hot all year round. Because it's hot all year round, we need a place outside that we can cook like a really cool barbecue area. We don't need as much big as much floor space, but you're going to have lots of animals around the yard. And I reckon there's going to be a four-wheel drive in the driveway that's got a boat attached to the back. Oh, right, 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 right. Now you've got two minutes. Build me a better, ha- better home. The resilient kids always build a better home in half the time because they're capable of receiving feedback, even when that feedback is on the other side of a cruel or even arbitrary failure. Lego, though, is a nice, safe place to practice that skill. So if it's not Jordan, it can be someone like Jessica Watson, who I think is um, possibly my most researched resilience hero when the kids actually start to have a really good look at it. Uh, She said, you don't have to be someone special to achieve something amazing. You've just got to have a dream, believe in it and work hard. And what I find when I talk to the students about what's, if you were to grab a highlighter and if I was only allowed, allowing you to highlight a couple of words, two words in that quote, what would you, what would you say is the two words that demonstrate most that Jessica Watson is resilient? And again, almost invariably, they highlight the words work hard. You know, keep going. She must have had times when she was sailing solo around the world as a teenager that she thought she couldn't make it. Um, But the reliance on the habit of working hard is something that is always evident within young people who who are resilient young people. I think that one of the things we're looking for also is what are the choices that in or one of the things we know we're looking for in young people is what are the choices they make before they encounter difficulty. So it's not just about what you do when you fall off the horse or the bike and you know, whether you can dust yourself up and off and get back on. It's about how much they seek challenge and difficulty in their life. Uh, I'm often showing young people, you know, um, this kind of video uh, game screen that, you and I may remember from you know, wonderful contraptions like the Atari 2600. Wasn't that fabulous? I loved, loved the days when a video game controller consisted of one stick and one button. It's so much simpler than the ones that uh, my teenagers hand me today. Um, and I'd remind them that when video games started in the old days, this is the screen that we used to get when we shoved a new cartridge into that Atari 2600. And... The kids often say, what do you mean? I go, well, you get to choose when you start the game. Are you going to start with the easy, the normal or the hard version? And they, and I said, what do you reckon? And they said, well, you'd have to start on the easy. And I go, oh, no, I did. I used to, I used to hover. The, I used to move the stick above the, the easy one. It would go red. And I go, okay, I'm going to press the button. And then a little component of my brain would stop me and say, all right, well, you could do easy. And you'll probably go, okay, because it is called easy. And a part of my brain would go, I wonder what would happen if you tried normal? if you just tried the, the middle level of difficulty and then I can, yeah, okay, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. And I'd move the little, you know, the little cursor with the stick over the normal, but it would go red and I'll be about to press that button. And one component of the component in my brain that stopped me previously would say, ah, bugger it. <laughs> Why don't you try the hard one and just see what happens. Even if you die, even if you die in five seconds, you'll learn something and then you'll probably come back and dominate the easy one. And kids go, really? I said, yeah. And sometimes you'd go in and you'd die. And they go, oh, no. And I'd say, well, what do you reckon? What would most kids be likely to choose this day, these days? Where would they start? And most of them agree that they would choose easy. And I think that's a really interesting activity and sort of social activity or hypothesis to run and to allow them to realise that one of the difficulties they face is that they just don't put themselves in enough difficulty. They don't choose challenge. They choose easy too often. What's the lesson for us as parents? I'd love to, if I can skip here, even though we're still early in the webinar, to a moral of the story for you. The lesson here for parents is how can we, as often as possible, have our kids in the right window between too hard and too easy? How can we get them to at least click normal? The question for you as a parent is what is it that your kids are doing at home Sorry, I'll rephrase that. What is it that you are doing for your kids at home that they could do if you just let them, if you just encourage them to? So it can be really simple things. So it can be, you know, uh, putting their dishes in the sink. Uh, It can be 
you know, um, making sure that they're, you know, they go through a bedtime routine of brushing their teeth, putting pajamas on, and, and jumping into bed uh, for ten minutes of reading. Uh, it can be, you know, getting their own lunch ready the night before, um, you know, or at least helping you to do that. What we're trying to do is to keep them in the achievement zone. You know, keep them in the motivating zone because what the kids tell me is that when you pick easy and you dominate, it doesn't really feel that fantastic. You've got to get them in the normal and maybe even occasionally in the hard for it to feel really cool. Now, for parents who hear that, they say, we sometimes go, oh, you know, we sometimes think that, you know, okay, there's a, there's a couple of things I could do about that. And sometimes we're a bit confronted. Oh, well, you know, I, I'm a good parent. I do lots of things for my, for my kids. Um, a great parent is one who releases responsibility to your kids when they see the opportunity. And most of the time, the only reason you might not be doing it is habits. <laughs> You're just busy and you've created certain habits in your family. Um, my lovely wife, Anthea, and I realised one we had recently for our two teenagers where we had Sunday nights. The habit of our Sunday night at home was that we would iron their school shirts for the week. When they were 17 and 15, one night we said, um, what, why, what, why exactly are we uh, ironing shirts for 17-year-olds and 15-year-olds? And we went, I don't really know. We didn't have a very good answer to that other than it had become the habit of our lives. So just look at the habits that you've got in your home. Look at the things that you do habitually for your kids that you could do for them sorry, that they could do themselves and release that responsibility to them is one of the pieces of advice I would provide you with today. How do you know? How can you know if your kid is a resilient kid? Um, there's a handful of indicators that we can look for. Number one is they have what we call an appropriate mix of pride and determination. So what I mean by that is that they, appropriate is the most important word in there. Uh, in that particularly when it comes to pride, you can have too much. So what we don't want, resilient kids, uh, students who lack resilient, young people who lack resilience, often have incredibly high pride, which means they think they're fantastic and they're not. This is actually something that uh, has been born out of some of the studies that we've looked at in the United States. And sadly for the United States, uh, their high schools and colleges have begun over the last few years to produce young people who are performing worse academically than the sort of cohorts and generations of students that have gone through before them. It's the very first time in American history that if you were to take a really crude examination of that, you might say their young people are a little bit dumber than the ones who came through previously. That's harsh, isn't it? But their self-esteem scales are through the roof. They think they're fantastic. They think they're awesome. And they're not. And they're not. So what we don't want our young people to do is to have pride, because it sounds positive, uh, because they exist. We want them to attach pride to effort, to determination, and uh, to a little bit of resilience, to having a go. So we want them to know that we're proud of them, not because they can draw breath. Uh, that gives an overinflated sense of pride that leads young people to become uh, lacking in resilience because they, you don't have to try to be awesome. Uh, but we want them to know that when they try, even when they fail miserably, uh, that we are outrageously proud of them. If you take your child to a sporting event, a lot of kids, uh, a lot of people speak, speak to me about sporting events and how they, their sport can be fabulous for building resilience. It absolutely can be. When your child plays a stinker, when your child um, drops the winning catch, when your child misses the winning goal, um, that's the time to be proud attach it to the effort, attach it to the fact they put themselves in that Michael Jordan situation and risked failure. And when that sting of failure comes along, that's the time to let them know that we're proud of them because they took the risk. They demonstrate a never give up attitude. Um, as a teacher, we love teaching these students. I many times have found myself walking over and seeing a student struggling with a maths worksheet or a problem, knowing that if they could just get number three right, the rest of it's gonna get really easy. And I just say to them, look, let me help you with number three. And they go, no, don't you help me. I can do it on my own. I go, okay, take a chill pill. And I walk away thinking to myself, how fantastic. How great is it that you have young people in your midst that, that know that they will not get the benefit, they will not get the payoff, they will not get the thrill of completing this task if they're helped at a point that they really don't need the help. 
they understand that the, temp the temporary nature of most problems, they get that most problems aren't all consuming. You know, most of us as adults would agree that there are only a very small set of problems that stay with us forever in our lives. Most problems that we encounter in our lives, at some point we get past. And they also know that most people who do succeed that get past most problems in their life, persevere. They attack problems from various angles. If at first you don't succeed, try and try again in a completely different way if you have to. And one of the things that often parents, as parents we forget is that kids who are resilient, they have what we call extensive support networks. They have multiple people in their lives that they can go to for multiple challenges. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Uh, there's a little exercise that you can do, even if you just do it yourself now, and you can change some of the words on here that can be kid appropriate. But if you think about your hand, if you hold your hand out, and you think about these five different domains that we might assign to your fingers. So we might think about if you had a problem with your friends, that's the pinky. If you had a problem with, the, with somebody in your neighbourhood, in your, in your street, then, okay, that's the next finger. If you had a problem at work, that's your middle finger. And no, there's not a reason that the middle finger is for work, you cruel and horrible people. Um, if there's a problem, if you had a problem online with somebody being mean to you in, the, in, in cyberspace, or if you had a problem with your social group. So say for me, I would say, okay, that's maybe uh, my cricket club I salute, but I'm still heavily involved in if there was a problem down there. And then if you were to say, if I was to write a name on each of those fingers and thumb there, that would be the name of the person that I would go to if I had a problem in that domain, could you do it? And then I want to test you a little further. I'm now going to say to you that you're not allowed to use the same name twice. You need five different names on there how difficult that would be. Now, some people find that extraordinarily difficult. I actually had a, um, actually had a, um, uh, a teacher at a professional learning day that I gave this activity to them to do, uh, come and talk to me at lunchtime. She's quite distressed. And she said to me, Adam, I, I just, I really, really didn't like that resilience activity with the hand. And I said, well, what do you mean? And tell, tell me about that. And she said, I have a twin sister. And she said, my twin sister is also a teacher, but she doesn't teach at this school. Um, so what we do at the end of the school day is we text each other when, when one of us is leaving and the other tries to leave at the same time. Uh, we get in our respect, we leave our respective schools, we get in our respective cars and we drive home to our respective homes. And for both of us, that journey is around 30 or 40 minutes. And we talk, hands free, in the car. And she said, if I had a problem with any of those five domains, I would talk to her about it. And you're trying to tell me that's a bad thing. Now, I took the estimation here that coming up with a line such as, what if your sister got hit by a bus would not be the wisest move that I could ever make. So I watered it down a little. And I said, well, what if your sister took some long service leave from work and took a 10 week holiday across South America and she was incontactable at that time? And she said, well, that'd be horrible. And I said, yes for you, <laughs> not so much for her. She'd be having a fabulous time. What we know about resilient people is they find subs. If they can't find their favourite persons, it's not saying you can't have a favourite person. It's not saying you can't talk to your kids about all these things. But if your kid can't get past two or three fingers, um, your job is not to say, well, I'll be, the, I'll, I'll be the fourth and the fifth one for you. Your job is to ask them the question, who would you like to connect with better? Who would you like to be able to speak to if you had a problem in that space? And as a parent, you become a dating agency then. You, you arrange an introduction. You know, just send an email to the school and let your kid's teacher know that he'd like to be able to chat with you if there's a problem in his social group. Is that cool? And I, know, I don't know one teacher that wouldn't go up to that student and say, hey, you know, how's things at the cricket club? How's things in the band? You know, um, anything you like to talk about? If anything comes along, you just come and see me. You and me, we'll talk about that anytime you need it. Um, we need to give people the opportunity to reach out by letting them know that they're needed. Um, and, you know, whether it's a, a family member, a friend, someone in your street, uh, people are always willing to help if they know that we want them to be the person on that hand. You don't have to save your kid by being all things to them. In fact, you're doing them a wonderful service by encouraging them to look outside of their own, uh, out of their own bubble to find somebody who they could connect with in a really meaningful way. Let's just do a quick check of my 
questions and hands and just making sure I've got that under control there. So please remember, you're not on Netflix, you're welcome to join in. So our target is a high level of resilience. And sometimes we're duped, we're tricked into thinking that resilience demonstrated in circumstances where you fight on and live through pain and difficulty is really high level resilience. And it's not. We call it mid-level resilience, which means that we've got a young person who's capable of being resilient, but it's only in their favourite place. It's only in the spot that they want to be resilient or they find it comfortable to be resilient. Um, all teachers that you talk to will be able to tell you about a student that they have taught who would finish a game of football, like you can see on the screen here, with a broken leg, um, but will lose their minds if they can't, are asked to count in front of the class. <laughs> so what that young person has is mid-level resilience. They're capable of being resilient, but they haven't learned to move it. They haven't been able to mobilise that resilience to multiple domains of their life yet. So they're nearly there, but just because you can demonstrate resilience in one place doesn't mean that you've got the whole thing down. What we're looking for is high level resilience, which are students who would choose the hard level on, a video, on an old video game. They're students who chase challenges and they're students who have got that mobility around their resilience to be able to move it to another place, even if it's unpleasant for them. Now I have um, these days a 19 year old daughter and when she was at school, um, she, had, she had some things that she was fabulous at and some things that she wasn't. Now, Ebony, had a pretty challenging birth and, you know, unfortunately is blessed with her father's coordination also. So she was kind of slow on the whole sort of walking and, um, and, and being able to run and, you know, she's not the most coordinated mover in the world and that's okay. She more than compensates for that with her amazing love of reading. She, she can devour books. We were reading you know, Harry Potter novels together when she was six years of age and, we're incredibly proud of the fact that we think we're one of the few people in the world, some of the few people in the world that have read all of the books out loud. Um, she just was relentless about wanting to read more. And we did all of that together, which is fabulous. But that's her, Ebony's ability to devour three books a week in a weekend um, is not why she's resilient. Uh, Ebony's resilient because despite her mobility and, and muscle tone issues, um, when it came to her at high school, having inter-school sport cross-country uh, cross day, uh, Ebony would walk out in the morning with her sports uniform on. And I would say, Eb, sports uniform, what's going on? She said, I got cross-country cross today. And I'd go, right, cross-country, how are you going to go? And she would go, I reckon I'm going to come last. <laughs> I'd go, really? And she'd go, yeah. And she goes, I'll, I'll just try to, I'll try to not walk. I'll see if I can shuffle my way through the whole thing. And I think that's fantastic. Um, more than fantastic, actually, because I know full well that there were several of Ebony's friends who were kind of getting their parents to write fake notes to say that they were, you know, had a sore ankle or it was that time or there's some reason that they couldn't possibly be able to complete a three kilometre cross country uh, jog. Uh, but not Ebony. You know, she was able to move that resilience to a domain of her life that was not a comfortable one for her. And of that, I'm, I'm really, really proud. Um, but of course, if we've got mid-level and we've got high-level resilience, then low-level resilience exists. And they're, unfortunately, our kids who will tell us that everything's crap and they'll avoid um, initiating and avoid difficult situations. And sometimes that includes school. You know, that, so school, re school, um, school refusal often is born of a lack of resilience. And what we need to do is to try and get them in that window between too hard and too easy. So sometimes when we've got a full scale school refuser on our hands who refuses ever to go to school, what we're asking them to do sometimes is to go for one day. Can you just get through one day for me? And one day feels like an eternity for, for them. That's unfortunately, even though it sounds ridiculous, in the too hard basket. If we can get them to become the student who goes to school. So if we can get them in the car, take them to school, have them watch the kids walk into the yard and then have them go home, that's a start. So we start to change some of their internal dialogue by changing how they see themselves. They're not the kid anymore who doesn't go to school. Yes, you do. We haven't gone in yet, but we've got up and we've gone to school. You are the kid who goes to school. You did that. And then we could work out, could you go in for an hour? 
with me? You know, then could you go in for an hour without me? Then could it be two hours with me, two hours without, two and one? And we can build upon that because what we're doing is just slowly upwardly moving that window between too hard and too easy uh, to the point where they experience success. With success uh, comes a feeling of excitement uh, and people who are in teacher aid positions who work with kids who struggle with reading will tell you that the only way that you can get a kid to feel excited about reading is in the moment where they read a word that you knew they couldn't, that they believe they couldn't read. They read it correct, they read it, and then they look at you as though, can you correct me now? And you go, no, that was, that was right. And a grin creeps across their face and their eyes go straight back to the book because now we want to read. It's a tiny win. It's a little bit of success. And if we can get that in place, we can build upon success. What comes when kids fail because they know they can't get through a full day, they know it's too much, is that um, they fail and the feeling that comes with that is shame. And that's when they start to assign the wrong label to themselves, such as, I, you know, I suck at school. We don't want them to believe, to believe that they suck at school. We want them to believe that they're the kid who goes to school um, and I'm slowly going for longer periods of time. So that's how we can start to you know, take ourselves out of some of those really low resilience positions for them. If I were to go back to my hero, and again, I, you know, I, I'm peppering this hero notion through. I, I talk a lot about Muhammad Ali um, and it wasn't his boxing. So what a lot of people don't know about Muhammad Ali was that he was also not only heavyweight champion of the world, but he was dyslexic and um, profoundly so. He said that a lot of people remember Ali for his verbose articulation and speaking. Um, he says that he probably became good at that because he was so, so bad at reading and writing. Um, but he also realised that he wasn't also, he wasn't becoming, he wasn't tackling that problem in his life the way that he tackled his boxing career. So his boxing career, he was the only person ever to have won the heavyweight title three times. And he used to point out, that means I've lost it three times. You see, I was the world heavyweight champion of getting up, he would tell people. Um, so rather than hide from reading and writing any longer, um, in his, uh, you know, his, when he was a middle-aged man, he enrolled in poetry courses to try and immerse himself in the bit that was difficult, to try and move his resilience from, hot, from, from the, his favourite place to his least favourite place. And some almanacs Ali is listed as um, having the shortest poem in the world. It's me, we, very short. Um, and also Ali was famous for taking poetry that he found and putting it up around the gym. So for some of his later fights, he had you know, poem, posters up on the wall, wall of short poems and quotes from poems that meant a lot to him. One was uh, by Florence Shin that said, every great work, every major achievement is brought into being through holding the vision. And often before the accomplishment comes apparent failure and disappointment for the greatest achievement in life is not in ever failing, but in rising again when you fall. So it's a poem about getting up and um, sharing that in some way. I, I certainly saw it too. As a principal, I used to have that poem on my door and it was just a subtle message to anybody in my, in my school that sure, come to me with a problem, any problem, but be aware we're getting up. That's what I want people to know. Um, and so, you know, sharing some of those examples, those heroes, those poems, those stories is just such a valuable way to be able to, to, be able to help a young person um, to be able to learn the habit of getting up. Um, many years ago, the, uh, the New York Times ran a survey. I'm going to give you just a little break from my voice in just a moment. Um, ran a survey about who was the most resilient character in American fictional history. And they studied books and they studied movies and they studied TV shows and they even studied cartoons. And I'm wondering, given what I've told you today, why you might think that Wile E. Coyote won the award. <laughs>
thing I love most about that clip is it was a gift. It was made by the, the crew at Looney Tunes to congratulate Wile E. Coyote uh, on winning that award because they wanted to make one cartoon where he catches the Roadrunner and this is what they came up with. Uh, when they ran this survey, this competition to see who was the most resilient character in American fictional history, they also asked people to give reason why, why what made, the, what made the, their choice the most resilient. The two answers that came back for Wile E. Coyote were one, he just never gave up. And two, he never attacked the problem the same way twice. I think that's admirable, admirable. Hey, um, we're coming to the end of our webinar. So please, if you do have any questions, now's the time, now's the time. But before I let you leave, what I wanted to do was do a couple of things. And one's a bit of a promise I'm gonna make you at the end of the webinar. So please don't uh, scarper now, stick around. I've got something I wanna, I wanna, I wanna say to you right at the end. Um, first thing is I want you to know that as partners of Real Schools, Frankston Primary School has accessed every single person in their community to the to the member member section of our website. Um, so if you head to realschools.com.au, you'll see a, a little tab for member login. And if you head to member login and use the login Frankston PS as your login and password, you'll be able to look at all the resources that the teacher's using. Now, the truth is we used to have a, um, we used to have a section just for parents. And then I was asked one day, why do you have a section that's just for the parents? And that means the parents don't get to see all of the resources you make. And I really didn't have a very good answer for that. So I took it on to close the parent section and to decide that what we'll do is just let everyone have a look. So know that there are all sorts of articles in there that most pertain to teaching and learning, but you can know what the school's talking about there. Um, there's videos, there's webinars, there's all sorts of stuff in there that you'll be able to put your heads into and, um, and just enjoy and know that because the truth is the school wants to be on the same page with you around that. Hey, uh, oh, gee, I, I do apologise. I'm going to have a go at the name, um, Anisha. Okay, I'm sure you're going to get co correct me on that. So I do apologise if I've got that wrong. Um, I'm just going to see if I can get in there now, Anisha's hand is up and I'm gonna allow you to talk. Okay, let's just see if that works. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, can you hear Wonderful, me? I cannot believe the technology didn't let us down. <laughs> what, was I anywhere near it with the pronunciation of your name? Um, almost, very good, um, it's a Dutch name. So the GJ is a Gia sound, so Anisha. Anisha. But that's really fine. Thank I think you. I'll be saying it in my sleep tonight, trying to get it. <laughs> <laughs> what, can, what can I do for you? Um, my question, I guess this, I've got two questions. First of all, what is a way, what's the, what's the best way to react when you're, you don't see your child being as resilient as you believe yeah. they could be? And this, my second question is, what happens if you're not very resilient as an adult? And how do you, there are times like where you don't, you're not always at your best or yep. you could definitely do better. And even in my own life, I, I looked at that, that some of those points and I thought, I'm not sure I meet all of them sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really try. We're horrible, um, imperfect human beings. Yeah, yeah. And so how do I, What's the best way to um, help? Yep. Like explain that, or like also when I reflect on that, yeah. So for my child, but also for me, like yeah. to 
Does that make sense to, to, yeah, sorry. Absolutely it does, absolutely it does. So how do we react first of all when your child doesn't show resilience? So if they were to you know, fall apart under pressure or they go, you know, something goes wrong and they don't handle it well, um, the best way to do it is empathically. So empath empathy is about saying that you can see what it's like for them. So, you know, it, and so it's not about saying that you know what it's like because that's sympathy. So sympathy is kind of, you know, oh, I know exactly what you're going through. This happened to me. I was like that when I was in year four and it was terrible. These girls picked on me. I've never really gotten over it. And it's all about me. Um, but if empathy is, I can see this is really hard for you. Um, let's have a, let, let's go to a place where we can have a talk about it. You know, so if they, if they know that you see them, uh, the chances of them complying with the next step of let's get out of here, because the truth is once they've demonstrated that lack of resilience, it's hard to get it back. They're emotional and being able to talk to the, the emotional brain successfully is really tricky. We need to get back to the thinking brain, which means survive it, you know, get them in a place where they can get calm again and where we can strategize for the next step. So we could compart we can talk about it. We basically what I'm saying to you is that we, what I want you to do is to start to use it as a learning experience to plan to, for, for an improvement next time. Um, practicing with your child the way they're going to handle that situation is a really valuable thing to do. I'm often talking to parents around bullying, you know, in this situation. And if they ever encounter bullying, and the truth is at some stage they probably will, you know, as children test boundaries, including boundaries of power all of the time, they'll probably encounter someone who does that. But if, you can, if you've got a young person who falls apart as soon as somebody, for instance, calls them a name or, um, you know, picks on them in some way or excludes them, um, we often talk about the best way to, do, to deal with that is, you know, I believe that the universal uh, best word in the world for dealing with bullying is whatever. And so if you can sit down with your child and say, well, okay, if this happens, then this is the reaction. So the difficulty for a lot of our kids is they just don't know the right reaction. They get emotional and I'm not sure what to do. And so unfortunately, sometimes that, that results in them, you know, as I've mentioned a couple of times, falling down or, bra or, or break, falling apart or breaking down. Um, if they can just learn to go whatever, and if they can flick their, flick their hair a little bit or roll the eyes a little bit and walk away. And if you can practice that with your child, so no, 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 you can do a better whatever than that. Come on, come on. You're not getting dinner until I, <laughs> until I see a really good whatever where you, you know, you flick the hair back and you, you know, look at your nails for a moment. You know, if you can make fun of that practice, then they've learned a really important skill. They've learned some language that they can attach to that moment. And they've learned a behavior that's pretty simple, which is if this, then that. And so practicing that with them is the advice that I would give. In terms of your own resilience and how you can be a role model, around being resilient with your child, the great news is that you get to be really selective and sneaky about it. And what I mean by that is if you can apply, you know, when I spoke before about the, the find the one thing in your child's life that you're doing for them that you, that they could do and give them a chance to do it. Um, as an adult, sometimes there might be something that you're not doing in your life that you could and just give them a chance to see you have a go at it. You know, so whether it's doing a handstand or whether it's making a new recipe, you know, and I'm not sure if I can pull this one off, but do you reckon you could watch me and give me advice while I try and get this right? You know, um, it's just thinking about what's the small thing in my life that I haven't done before that I think I could have a go at and then allowing your child to see it. So you become a resilient role model then by putting yourself in that window between too easy and too hard. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's really helpful, actually, because it's hard sometimes because you want to sort of... Like, it is, yeah. yeah you, you don't, you don't want to appear like... Because, you know, you don't... If, you, if I look like I don't know what's going on, I don't want to, you know, communicate to him. Yeah. Our kids don't need to see us as perfect beings. You know, they actually need to become resilient to see a struggle and they need to see what the attitude is to that. 
So if I were to give the example of you saying, well, I'll make a different, I'm going to make a dish in the kitchen that I've never made before. And I'm going to get my kid to sit on the stool and watch. And you're going to talk to me, talk me through this. And you let them hear yourself talk. Oh man, I'm not quite sure if I'm doing this right, the right way. You know, what do you think? Am I supposed to, you know, oh, should I give up? No, 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 I keep going. You know? And you let them hear the internal talk. Um, they'll, hear, they'll, they'll be able to take that language and use it themselves when, the, when moments like that come along for them. All right. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And actually, it reminds me of something that a, um, a childcare educator told me, which I didn't understand. At the I sort of didn't understand the significance of at the time. But yep. I, and she said, let him tell you what to do. Sometimes they love it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. I love it. <laughs> and the, the shift from being not resilient to, to being resilient is long. And it's, you know, if you view it as being sort of like a 180 degree turnaround, you know, it's what it's, it's, it's 180 times a one degree shift. So it's just lots of little examples. It's not, you don't need to fix it in a day. You don't need to fix it in an instant. You can't fix it by telling them harden up, be more resilient. Um, we just have to model it for them and put, and put themselves and ourselves in that little window as often as we can. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Thank oh, you. that's really good to know. I'm just going to mute you again. And that way they won't hear us breathing in the background. All right. Um, couple of things you can do to finish off. Thank you so much, Anikia. I, th oh, I hope I'm getting close <laughs> um, to, to that. Um, if you are interested in finding out more, we've got oh, more than 7,500 educators and parents connecting through the Real Schools Facebook page, if that's your thing, and you can even follow us on Twitter too. But the promise that I made you today was something a little extra. Now, I'd love you to stay in touch with us. Uh, so if you would like even the slide deck from today. Um, so if you send an email to that email address that we've circled on the screen there, info at realschools.com.au. Um, if you jump off the device at the end of this webinar and send an email to that, that just says Frankston Primary Parent Session, we will send you the entire slide deck from tonight's presentation. And I have only one request. Uh, as a thank you in return, would you please send it to someone who didn't make it tonight? You know, send it to someone who, you know, had to pick up the kids from, you know, football or band practice tonight and, um, and couldn't be here. We have recorded the webinar tonight. So where you've got, um, so that recording will be available to the school as well. So we want to be able to spread it far and wide. But um, if you would, you know, send it out there and get more and more people involved in this really important work for the school. Um, and if you've got any other questions, please make sure that you use that email address too. I'm going to finish where I began with a massive thank you. Um, thank you for being the kind of parents that will put aside that time um, and that will put aside the time to send, young, send their young people to the school um, with these kind of personal qualities that allow them to learn at their optimal level. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are done. Uh, go and enjoy the rest of your evening. And I hope to see you around Frankston Primary School again soon. Mm -hmm.